Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Rinks, and I'm on the Marin Healthcare District Board, and we are bringing you this event tonight. We put on a series of health seminars. Last one was on skin cancer, and we are delighted to bring you our seminar tonight. You're going to be joining us for an evening of a cooking demonstration with Hugh Gorman and his team from Hugh Groman Catering. We have a really fun evening planned for you tonight. The concept for tonight's event was born out of the need to help people learn how to create amazing food that is as healthy and simple as it is delicious. Before we get started, I want to introduce you to our celebrity chef, Hugh Groman. He has a love <laughs> of simple, vibrant, flavored food, and his attention to detail has made him one of the leading caterers in the Bay Area. Established in 2001, Hugh Groman Catering has catered events both large and small throughout the Bay Area, including events honoring notables such as Barack Obama, Michelle Barifnikoff, Nancy Pelosi, Lawrence Fishbourne, Sally Ride, Ariana Huffington, Harry Belafonte, Harrison Ford, Malcolm Gladwell, and Gloria Steinem, among others. He has held restaurant jobs throughout high school and college at Yale, where he graduated. Uh, whoops, <laughs> we got it. Um, at Yale, where he ma majored in psychology. So did I. Oh. Uh, I not at Yale, though. <laughs> <laughs> After graduating while living in New York, he took an extended culinary tour of the United States. He returned to New York in 1997, where he started a successful catering business. Eventually, he decided he needed to move back home to the Bay Area because, you know, how could you stay away? Where he launched Hugh Groman Catering. In 2007, he launched Green Leaf Platters, and later, in 2011, he opened Phil's Sliders, a yummy slider restaurant that is a love child of In-N-Out Burger and Chez Panisse. His, he applies his creativity and love of food when creating menus and recipe and counts amongst his influence Tom Col Colicetti. Colicchio. Sorry, Colicchio, and he told me that, and I <laughs> forgot. Colicchio for his aesthetic commitment to freshness and simplicity, and Danny Meyer for his business acumen and unwavering dedication to high quality in all its restaurants. If anyone wishes to listen this evening in Spanish, we have a translator here who will be translating tonight's presentation in real time. We'd simply provide you with a headset so you can hear the entire evening in Spanish. So let us know if you need that. We've got headsets up here for you if you do. We also have a recipe booklet for you so you can make these yummy recipes at home. The booklet is also provided in both English and Spanish. So with that said, please join me in welcoming Hugh Groman. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for showing up. It's very sweet to see you all here. Um, we're going to start out by just sharing a fun little video. Uh, this is um, a clip from KTVU. I've been lucky enough to be doing cooking demonstrations on uh, the local news for about six years or so. And um, uh, this is something that happened recently. And I'll, I'll give you a little foreshadowing here that uh, people keep saying to me, why are you showing people this video? New Year's Eve, and whether you're hosting a party or staying in to bring 2024 in, get champagne ready there for you. Uh, we have a recipe to make sure the last hours of 2023 are exquisite. And joining us now is Hugh Groman of Hugh Groman Catering. He's going to show us how to make ginger prosecco. He's already got the prosecco out. We heard that. And grilled cheese, kind of a common sandwich, but you are souping them up. Everybody loves love grilled cheese. cheese. It's always good to bring it back. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Happy New Year. So I wanted to start out and show you how to open up this bottle of prosecco because a lot of people don't know yeah. how. And I watch people try to do this. And there could be accidents it's tomorrow night. It's terrifying. Okay. okay. So we first, you, you take off the uh, metal screw top and you rip off the... the, the Whoa! Oh. Okay. Oh. Clearly that that is not how to do it. Just a flesh wound. I'm okay. Okay. I, oh will, I will say, you see how I had my hand over the top? I'm kind of glad you did. That's why I do that. Wow. That was awesome. That was just, just, you I know, wish I could, I could have, I wish I could have planned that. So, maybe I'm not the best at opening champagne. Um, somebody took a clip of that and put it on the internet and uh, it went viral. There were like over two million views and the comments were not kind. It was rough. Don't read stuff on the internet. It is terrifying. So uh, I've got a bunch of stuff to show you today. Um, I, uh, I'm very excited to 
you know, have plenty of time. Normally it's five minutes on the news, so having you know, an hour or so to show you a bunch of things this feels like very decadent. Um, I thought maybe I'd just start out by sharing a couple of stories about hospitality. Um, these are things that happened in my life that had a real impact on me. Um, and uh, it really, they're sort of my origin stories around hospitality. Um, the first story, I've told this story many, many times, um, but it, uh, it always, uh, I feel it every time. Um, I was about 13 years old, and I was at the dinner table with both of my parents, and um, they had a lot of dinner parties. They were very hospitable people, very relaxed. And there was, you know, 10 people around the table, just their friends, really, and I was the only kid there, except there was a foreign exchange student who had been brought by one of the guests. And they were about 21, and they were from France, and I don't think they spoke much English, and it was very awkward for them, clearly. Um, and during the meal, uh, she reached for her glass of red wine and just knocked it over by accident. And there was this kind of a, you know, that moment where everyone's kind of surprised and they, there's this intake of breath and a moment of silence and, you know, the red wine spilled all over the white tablecloth. And my father, without skipping a beat, backhanded his own glass of wine onto the table as well. Um, I think there's like a, I think that happened with like the Queen of England or something at one point. But I was like, wow. And it really said something to me, that the most important thing about hospitality is putting people at ease and allowing them to be you know, who they are in your home. So that has stuck with me since then. Um, another story about my parents. Um, when I was about seven years old, I was uh, making potato chips. I loved to cook from a very early age. And it was the 70s, <clears throat> so the level of parental supervision was extremely low. <laughs> so I'm, you know, cutting up potatoes and I'm, you know, putting oil on the burner like this. Maybe I'll even do that now because I'm going to have to make this hot for later. Let's see what happens today. Um, and, um, and, I put the potatoes in, and I was an experienced enough cook to know that they hadn't, they weren't sizzling, so the oil was not hot enough. <sighs> so, as a, someone who's a busy person, I like to get a, fit in a lot of different activities. I decided to go swimming, <laughs> and um, I was in the pool. And then I remember distinctly this moment. I heard my dad say, "Oh shit!" <laughs> and there was white smoke coming out of the kitchen. And my father ran in, slipping and sliding, and he was able to put the fire out with minimal damage to the house. I don't think we had to move out. And they, the thing I remember about the aftermath was my parents said to me, well, we wanted to remodel the kitchen, and now the insurance will pay for it. <laughs> and I feel like that's another story about hospitality. It's sort of the, the way that they treated me and you know, forgave me pretty much instantly. And that is just, you know, more of how my parents impacted you know, me with hospitality. So I'm going to get started and start demonstrating um, uh, some of this yummy food. Um, we're starting out with the hors d'oeuvre. Uh, it's the edamame puree with uh, toasted garlic and lemon and um, red pepper flakes, lemon and olive oil. And today we're serving it with homemade tortilla chips, but um, sometimes I'll do it with um, polenta or on a baguette toast. Um, it's really good with some Pecorino Romano cheese, like uh, shaved on top, a little hors d'oeuvre on a baguette toast. And I've got, you know, like a, just a thin little slice of bread toasted nice and crunchy. Um, and this is gonna be the trick. Can I get the oil just the right temperature for when it's time to deep fry without setting off all the fire alarms? It's exciting. Um, so, uh, and then, um, so I'm going to show you how to make the edamame puree, and then I'm going to show you how to fry the tortillas. Um, and so uh, this is real simple. We've got a little food processor here. And these, these edamame, you buy these frozen. We just boil them in salty water for just two or three minutes. And, and then you can um, drain them. And if you want to get fancy, you can just you can shock them in some icy water and then uh, drain them again. That stops the cooking. And, um, and then... Um, I'm going to just show you how to chop some garlic here. Uh, and what we're going to do with the garlic is we're going to put half of it in raw, and we're going to put half of it in toasted or nutted is what I like to call it. And that what that means is it's, um, 
it's, uh, it's sauteed until it just starts to change color. And as most of you know, if you cook at all, that's tricky. You, it's, it goes from toasted to burnt real fast. Um, so here's the claw. You've probably heard about the claw. That's what you do with your left hand to protect your fingertips from getting cut off. Um, and I'm just gonna slice up this garlic real quick. And, um, and then I'm just gonna show you how to, to nut this garlic in here. This, I'm gonna turn this saute pan on as well, because we're gonna saute it with just a little bit of olive oil. And, um, and then, once that's ready, I'm just gonna put all the ingredients in the food processor and puree it all up, and it's as simple as that. Um, and uh, I wanna invite everybody to ask questions. If you have a question, um, just kind of raise your hand and make a little noise of some kind, and there's a couple people with mics, and I don't mind being interrupted. I come from an interrupting family, and I'm very comfortable with it. So if some of you are uncomfortable with that, I promise I won't interrupt you, but I don't mind. So I'm happy to have this be like a free-flowing conversation, and I can answer questions and tell stories and things like that. Great. Hi. First of all, thanks for being here. Um, starving. Sec <laughs> Get some more hors d'oeuvres. What kind of oils do you use? Oh, when great you question. Them up? So, oil, that's like an endless conversation. You know, what's the healthy kind of oil? I'm still stuck on canola oil, but it's kind of been discredited. You know, it, that was used to be like, a, um, it used to be like, you know, the healthy oil, and then it turns out the chemicals required to process the oil out of the canola seed are questionable. So, it, you know, the whole conversation about oil is very political right now. So here, so I, I'm not sure if we're showing, yeah, we're seeing it. So, you know, the, the oil was hot and already it's starting to tan. So I'm keeping a super close eye on this. I'm taking it off the burner. I'm turning this off. And, um, and uh, there we go. We're good. So, and I'm actually going to pop it out of the pan so it doesn't get any darker. So um, obviously, uh, or maybe not obviously, we use a lot of olive oil. I use extra virgin olive oil. I use a lot of plain olive oil, which is, you know, not the first press, but I like it because it's more mild and it has a lot of, um, it has a lot of, uh, it, it, you know, extra virgin can be really bitter sometimes, and I sometimes find it overwhelming. So I use a lot of plain olive oil. Um, avocado oil is very much in fashion now. Rice bran oil is considered to be healthier, but I have, I've had weird experiences with frying with rice bran oil. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, Can I say sure. Grape seed oil is another one, right? Yeah. Or peanut. Right. And peanut is great. Peanut ha gives you great, um, a, a great experience, but everyone is so afraid of peanut oil now. Well, I understand that, but people should be aware. If you heat olive oil at a high temperature, you've ruined it, and you've also ruined your meal. Right. Correct? It, it, it has a high smoke, a low smoke low point. Smoke, yeah. So for sautéing, that's why I use canola oil, but um, avocado oil has a high smoke point. Grapeseed oil has a high smoke point. But always, can I buy your knife? <laughs> you want to buy my knife? I want your knife. You know, this shape is great. If you don't have one of these with the flat and the... It's just the perfect knife for almost everything. Okay, so we're going to the edamame puree here. We've got a little bit of this nutted garlic, and then a little bit of the raw garlic. We've all got garlic breath now, so it's fine, because everybody has it. And I think with COVID these days, if you can smell somebody's breath, you're too close. Um, and I've got a little bit of um, lemon zest here. And um, this is another great tool. If you don't have one of these, who has one of these? Yeah. If you don't, this is great. I use it for garlic. I use it for zesting lemons like this. Nutmeg. Nutmeg is it's exactly. Yeah, this is Marin. Everybody already knows all this stuff. <laughs> but um, so it's great. It's, uh, it, it's really fast, too. So, um, and then we've got a little bit of lemon juice, fresh squeezed lemon juice, some red pepper flakes. And then I put a little salt and pepper. I'm afraid you're not going to get a lot of low-sodium ideas from me, but you can always just put less salt. Um, and then uh, a little bit of olive oil. This is the plain olive oil, and I think I'll use that. 
and then you just process it. Oops. I am not as familiar with this particular food processor, so we're gonna see what happens. There we go. Okay. The, yeah, uh, yeah. He asked, "Does extra light olive oil have a low smoking point for cooking?" Honestly, I don't see extra light a lot. I don't know. That feels kind of, sounds like a gimmick to me. Because if it's oil, it's oil. If it's if it's you know, it's it can't have like anything in there to to lighten it exactly. But it's but the plain olive oil that that's what I generally see. Um, it does have a lower smoking point. When do you chop the garlic versus using the microplane to mm -hmm. get it smaller? Oh, why? Well, or when, like, oh, when? what kind of recipes well, would you chop right. it for, and what kind would you use the microplane? I, the microplane is when is like a, a better version of the um, of the uh, uh, garlic press. I hate garlic presses. I, I mean, has anyone ever put a garlic press in a dishwasher and had it come out clean? It's like, what do we even do it for? It's just uh, let's now scrape it out. It's just so I just don't. I don't like garlic presses. Um, so it's like it does. It just. I guess it gives you like a more pungent fragrant, you know, garlic. But when I'm sautéing, I want to have piece, individual pieces. I don't want a big, uh, mushy, mushy chunk. All right. So I'm just going to taste this, and you'll have to trust me that it's delicious, because you had your own. This is a little trick we do on the back of our hand. It's good. It needs to be pure processed a bit more, but I don't need you to stare at me while I process. So um, let's see how we're doing with this uh, oil. That's pretty good. I'm going to turn this up a bit. So with the, the homemade tortilla chips, you, um, you take these six-inch corn tortillas, and you just cut them into six wedges. Everyone always buys their tortilla chips, and you know, certainly that's easier, but these are really special, especially if you do it kind of a... Um, in a sort of a la minute style where you're, you're making them fresh for your guests and then they get them a little bit warm. That's really special. So, so I'm putting my hand over here to see if it's, it's hot and it does feel hot. Let's see, and then, oh, and I, when I drop it in, it's, it's bubbling a little bit, so I don't have to go swimming. Here we go. <laughs> and it just takes, um, you know, a short while here. There we go. That's good enough. So um, they're already bubbling. Can you see that from the camera? Yeah, you can. Fun. So you guys are going to know if I mess up, you're going to see. It's all burnt. And uh, here we go. So the, fat, the way this oil is behaving says I'm, I'm pretty on the right track with the heat of the oil. Um, if it started to brown immediately, it means I probably got it too hot. Um, 375 is kind of the max of where you want your oil to be. Um, now they have these fancy radars. Have you seen those? We, we have a couple of my team has one. I don't have one yet. But they just, they test the surface. It's like what, like the same thing they use to detect our temperature, I think. But um, for oil, it's so good. So, uh, so I think I'm doing pretty well here with this. It's just going to take another minute or two. And then, uh, you know, you can use a spider. Do you know what, do you, does everyone have a spider? That's like kind of a slotted spoon, but it's a little more meshy. Um, and, uh, and then you can just uh, drain these and put a little salt on them. So I'm just going to walk away for one second and hope that I don't get distracted. So meanwhile, I'm going to clear off my cutting board. And then I'm going to get into uh, making the rest of the dinner. Now, um, if anyone's still hungry and they want some more of this hors d'oeuvre, we have some trays in the back there. Don't be shy if you want to just get up, and I won't be distracted. I'll, I might heckle you a little bit, though. No, I, I won't. Um, so um, I'll tell you, um, there's another story about hospitality that I was going to tell you. Oh, shoot. Um, uh, this was uh, Joan Rivers. Um, I lived in New York, and I was in the um, 
New York Gay Men's Chorus. Surprise! And, uh, um, and Joan Rivers was a big supporter of the New York Gay Men's Chorus, and she would have a group of about 10 of us over to her house every year for her Christmas party, and we would sing. And so I got, was lucky enough to be chosen for that, and I went over there, and it was a lovely party, and we sang, and as, uh, you know, her beautiful apartment, and, and as we were, um, after we sang, we were invited to just stay as guests and drink and eat, and there was, like, lavish buffet after lavish buffet that kept changing. They kept bringing out more food and different food, and what really struck me was the old-school trays of cigarettes on the ottoman. And there was this like tray of c- just massive amounts of cigarettes. And I hate smoking, but I just thought, wow, like whatever you want to do in my home is okay. <laughs> That's what I got from it. And that really blew me away. It's that same, that same theme of hospitality. Um, I don't even think Joan Rivers smoked. It was just a classy move. So here we go. So these will cool off, and then I'll, I'll eat one later just to prove to you that they're delicious. Um, and I'll take this away so we don't hurt anybody. OK, so now I'm going to demonstrate um, the dinner. We've got a poached salmon with a, a maisonette sauce, and I'll tell you about that sauce and where I got that from. Um, there's a quinoa salad. I just made the scout salad up recently. It's a quinoa salad with avocado, raw red onion. Um, if you don't like raw onion, you could cook the onion. Uh, some cilantro. If you don't like cilantro, you could do scallions or parsley. Um, you can do lemon juice or lime juice. Um, and then uh, you know, there's other, other things you can put in option. Oh, cumin, lemon, olive oil, salt, pepper. But then there's some cauliflower. You could do the edamame, just the whole edamame that you've blanched. Um, and I think I mentioned the avocado. And uh, it's just a really nice salad. The, 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 when I'm creating a dish like this, I'm just trying to create as much dimension in your mouth as possible. Like you notice with the edamame puree, there's the lemon, the acidity, the garlic gives it this you know, umami uh, flavor. The edamame is rich, and the olive oil is rich. Um, and then the red pepper flakes make it spicy. So we're trying to just hit as many spots in your mouth as you can um, to give it dimension. And um, I'm going to just turn on some water here. Um, this is going to be to poach the salmon. Uh, no, it's going to be to poach the asparagus. And then I've got another pot that's going to be to poach the salmon. So um, with the, uh, it's all, it's all going to be sort of a timing thing here. So I'm going to be getting into all three dishes all, all at once. Um, so uh, first, I think what I'll do is I'll show you how to make the broth for poaching the salmon. And you know, the simplest broth you can do is just to do like a um, a lemon juice and salt. And I like it to be salty like the sea because it's it's not going to absorb, salt does not absorb into the fish, but it does affect the way the fish cooks and it will give it a really nice flavor. Salmon, you know, we, a little salt and a lot of acidity will take away any kind of fishiness that we don't want. So... I was kidding. So now this is going to be... Oh, you know what? I'll just... Thank you for catching that, Jennifer. Um, so I'm going to do this. This is going to be for the, uh, the salmon. Thank you. I appreciate that. Actually, it's quite helpful. And it'll be fine to have a little bit of lemon in the asparagus, too. Although I don't normally put that in there. So, um, so uh, we'll do a little bit more lemon juice and then some salt. And then that's kind of the basic. But if you want, you can do like a French court bouillon, which is like... Um, which is like uh, you know onions, carrots, celery, garlic, maybe some bay leaf. But um, you know I'm just trying to keep this simple for you, so you don't have to you know overdo here. So we've got the you know you can be complicated or you can keep it simple when you don't really feel like being too fussy. And so I'm going to throw in some of this extra garlic because I have it, and then a decent amount of. Salt. Yeah, but just remember, this is not all going into the fish. Like, it's, it's, the water is salty, but the fish is, is not going to absorb the salt. Um, it'll just be, it affects how it cooks, and then it will be a, a flavoring on the outside. And, um, and I'm also going to throw some sliced onions in here just for fun. 
So you all probably know how to cut an onion properly, but I'll just show you a little bit. Um, uh, everyone has tricks for not crying, right? I think the best one is a fan. Um, you set up a little fan, and it blows the air. Maybe you open a window or something, because you just want the air moving away from you. Otherwise, it's splattering up in your face, and that's when you get the trouble. And some, some onions are just so harsh, and you really get blasted from them. And some are uh, mild. But I'm pretty tough. I don't think this is going to get me. We'll see. Um, great. And so now this is just going to simmer a bit. And that'll simmer for 15 minutes, maybe, or maybe less, depending on how, how our uh, session goes. And then I'm going to show you how to poach the salmon. Excuse um, me, Chef, we have a question. Absolutely. Two questions, please. If you didn't want to use regular soy from the edamame, what would an alternative be? Because that was delicious. Oh, good. Um, fava beans, those are kind of hard to find. Mm -hmm. uh, fresh peas would be good. But you know, the, I wouldn't do frozen peas. I don't think the flavor would be great. But um, let me think what else. That is a great idea. I'm glad you liked it. And oh, you could definitely use like white beans. Um, lima beans, yeah. Any kind of like white light bean would work, would work really well with that, I think. OK? So we've got the, the court bouillon or the broth going. And we've got this uh, asparagus water going. And I'm just going to, did I, I put some salt in it already. I can see it. But I'm just going to go a little bit more. This is also needs to be salty like the sea. Can we do another question, please? Yeah. How does the salt affect the cooking of the salmon? You know, that's a really good question. I know there's, it's a, there's a very science-y type answer where um, it affects the cells and how they give out liquid and take in liquid. And... Um, and I, I, if I went beyond that, I'd be making it up. There's a cookbook called um, On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee. And I've never really been, I was never really that curious in school. But I, when I got that book, I read it cover to cover. It was like a, uh, it was like a, a textbook, but I read it cover to cover because it was so interesting. It talked about eggs and the, the emulsifications and the structures of proteins and how, you know, when you cook a piece of beef, you know, the, the, the outside, the, the protein network kind of tightens up, and that's why you have that way of testing for doneness, because the, it's t it starts out kind of mushy, and then it tightens and tightens and tightens and tightens. So that's why you get that different level of pushback on meat, and that's how you test for doneness. Okay? So that's going. The asparagus water's going. And now I'm just going to throw this quinoa salad together for you and show you how that's done. So the quinoa salad has... Um, this quinoa was um, just cooked with uh, two parts water, or you can do chicken broth, and um, one part uh, quinoa. So uh, I think it's I think for the recipe we put there is uh, three cups broth and one and a half cups quinoa. Um, I will tell you that the recipe I put together there, it, it's really a starting point. You can add, you can intensify the flavors. There, the flavors in that quinoa recipe that's in this pamphlet are pretty mild. And when we tasted it tonight, we decided to add more lemon, more cumin, more salt, more pepper to, to punch up the flavor. And um, the onion, this is a different way to cut the onion. This is going to be, you know, starts out the same. But this is the sort of the pro way of cutting an onion. And peel off the edge. Mm. I'm gonna find my, there we go, find my bones here as you wait and wait and wait for me to peel an onion. There we go. And, um, and then you're just gonna do a, like a cross hatch. So can we see what I'm doing? Yeah, you can. Okay, here, I'll take that away. So we're gonna go here and we're just really paying attention. You want a nice sharp knife to, and we're paying attention to having even cuts. Okay, and then you wanna have your knife horizontal, parallel to the, to the cutting board. That's the trick. If you're, if you're curving with your wrist, you're going to lose the, this is starting to boil, so I'm going to turn it down. And then this is, needs to be turned up a little bit. There we go. So, um, and so it's nice and horizontal. And again, I've got my left hand in the claw. And this knife, I would say, I'd give it a B minus on sharpness. The sharper your knife is, the better. 
and then again, and then just like that, a third way. And so you don't have to keep chopping and chopping and chopping the onion. It's already all cut up to the, to the size you want. And then I get kind of obsessive where I take the last little bits and I cut them up for another 15 minutes. There we go. <laughs> I do not like waste. Um, so I'm going to give it a little bit of raw onion. Yeah, correct. I've got the root end still on there. Yeah, I just trimmed it off. But um, I don't even know why, why I trim it off because I'm not going to use it. So it's a good question, actually. Um, yeah. I think maybe we're supposed to use the mic just for the sake of everybody. Just turning your attention back to the oil that you use, it seems like uh, I don't fry a lot because I... Uh, it's just a waste to do one little thing or yeah. two little things. Yeah. So how how do you justify that or or? Well, you know, luckily for work, we we um, we get to um, you know we we're, we're cooking large amounts of food. I would say use a really small pot, you know, so that you can uh, you know use less oil. Does that help? Yes and no. <laughs> I mean, still, we got, we got all this leftover oil. Right. Uh, you, uh, you're very knowledgeable. What's your name? Frank. Yeah. Pauline. Pauline uh, saying, you know, you can strain the oil and use it again. Um, I don't know. I didn't know you were from England until just now, Pauline. So, um, yeah. Although, the, you know... I prefer to reuse oil that's been used for things that are more vegetarian or whatever, like fish. It's kind of like, it can get a little smelly. And you, you wouldn't want to use it for fish and then fried donuts with it or something like that. That would be weird. Okay, so avocado, very similar procedure here. Um, I use the knife. I'm, I'm watching what I'm doing here. And then if it's ripe enough, it just pops out that way. And that goes in here. And then you want to have a big spoon. And scoop it out, and then I'm going to do that same kind of dicing procedure. Um, there we go. So it's all, you know, I'm, I'm really angling the spoon to up against the uh, skin so that it all comes out in one piece, right? And then it's that same. This one doesn't have a, a little thing holding it together. You just kind of have to have a sharp knife and make it work. Okay. Okay, and then, and then I, you know, you really want to watch because if you're careless, then you don't have nice little squares. But if you're, and if they're not nice little squares, it just doesn't matter, now does it? <laughs> they're probably going to get mushed up anyway in the salad. And again, I use at the end. So. Boom. And then I'm going to put in the cilantro and the other things here. I'm going to wipe my hand. So with the cilantro, I'm going to be fast and just kind of take out the biggest stems. I call this eagle eye. I'm just looking for the biggest stems. I don't want to sit and stare at each little leaf, but I'm just focusing on finding the big, thick stems so I can get those out of there. And you know the tender, the little thin tender ones are fine. And there we go. Again, the claw, the claw, the claw. Please don't cut your fingers off. That's just never a good day. It always happens at like you know Thanksgiving, right? The, the plumbing go, falls apart. You have to call a plumber on the holidays, and somebody breaks an ankle or cuts a finger off. Hi there. Right. Hello. Hi. I just wanted to ask you a question about your opinion on politics. When, when <laughs> you No, I'm just trying to articulate here. Um, when you dis 
distinguish between whether you're going to heat the oil before you start cooking or have the oil and the ingredients together before you heat it? Does I that make sense? I almost always heat the oil first. It's the way we're you taught. Do. Part yeah. of it is like it does. It keeps things from sticking to the pan. Well, um, that's the way I was always taught. Well, but who? I I'm guessing Italy, your husband or wife is. Uh, this is an argument that I'm settling publicly. Is that what's happening? No, Are, it's so funny because when I was in Italy uh, recently on a tour, we did a lot of cooking uh, visits to people's mm -hmm. homes and things, and um, they. They started everything with tempid. I mean, the only thing you would do that with is like, you know, maybe like if you're braising vegetables in oil or something like that. Um, I mean, it, I suppose it's fine in most cases. It just, it was, it, for, for me, it's mostly about like not having the thing, the, the meat or whatever stick to the pan. Or if you want to get color in the pan, and we can talk about that because that's a whole a thing that we do in restaurants a lot and people struggle with. Um, I'll get into that, but let me just catch you up with what I'm doing here. So I've got the um, onions, the avocado, the cilantro, a good amount of cumin. That's a really lovely flavor. I love cumin. I put it in a lot of things. I think it's very good for you, supposedly. Um, and then a little salt and pepper. And then, if does everyone have one of these? Yeah, yeah you got to have one of these. It's the best. And um, you can do lemon. You can do lime. I think the recipe calls for lemon, but... Um, you, I also make this with lime juice. Um, so yeah, using the, the whole thing with sauteing and browning food, I know a lot of home cooks really struggle with that. Uh, the number one thing is, is you want to have a good heavy pan. Cast iron works great. Um, I do enjoy a nonstick pan, but that's supposed to be bad for you. Now they have, the, they have the new pans that are supposed to be good for you, but who knows, maybe they're not good for you. Um, <laughs> It's just stressful. But I tell you, you know, when you get used to making an omelet in a, one of those fancy pans, you really don't want to give that up. Um, so um, the trick is you want a nice hot pan. Um, you want a, the right amount of oil, not too much, not too little. Um, if you put a lot of oil th in, um, you're kind of deep frying, and the oil won't get quite as hot, right, because there's more of it to get hot. You just want enough to kind of coat the pan and then you don't want to crowd the pan. That's the number one thing that people struggle with. Like scallops is the ultimate thing. Like, you know, you're trying to cook a bunch of scallops and if you crowd the pan, they just steam and they never get that beautiful brown color. But if you use like a little nice oil, like one of the good oils or butter with the scallops and you give a little bit of room to each one um, and, then you don't, and then don't mess with it. Don't play with it. Let it, just let it be, let it get cooked um, until it gets that brown color and then it will turn over really easily because it kind of releases. Question. Excuse me. I noticed that you've been using salt here and there. Yeah. There are so many kinds of salt. Are you using kosher salt when you when you cook yeah. I, rather I'm, than iodized salt school. or pink salt or finishing No, not salt? iodized. I use kosher salt for everything. Thanks for asking. I am not a salt snob except f about kosher salt. <laughs> but uh, you know, my husband's into the Malden and the blah, 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 and it's just like I find it exhausting. Like all of that's great, it's interesting, but the differences are so subtle. I think it's just something to keep us distracted from the existential angst of life. Um, <laughs> but, um, but like kosher salt is great, and I really like the diamond. Sorry, I'm, this is not a, a promotional plug, but I really love the diamond because that's the stuff that has, it's like big and flaky, and it's really porous. And the reason why chefs use kosher salt is because it's porous, and a tablespoon of kosher salt is much less salty than a tablespoon of table salt. It has more air, and it allows you, it has, you have more control. You know if you, if you grab some table salt with your fingers, it just clumps to your hand, it's a nightmare, or you're trying to sprinkle it evenly on a piece of meat and it drops and clumps. Co uh, you know, use dry hands, and then the kosher salt you have control over, because you can actually see it, it's less salty, so you can, you can put a, like a light dusting on there that's visible to you, and uh, you have control. So it's about control. That is fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I think I got everything in here. So again, avocado, red onion. Oh, and then this cauliflower. Um, when I made this dish, I had some of that frozen riced cauliflower in the uh, freezer. And so I figured, why not? Um, it gives it just some more vegetable content. And so you can take that and microwave it until it's hot and throw that in as well. Um, you can do the edamame in here. Um, you could do fresh peas. I, 
I, I'm, I like frozen peas like a cafeteria style, but I would never really want to use them for, for guests. It's more of like a dirty secret, dirty, a dirty pleasure. Um, okay, so let's see how I did here. It's delicious. Um, all right. So um, I think I'm just going to show you now the asparagus. We're going to talk about asparagus. So how to pick asparagus. Um, I'm going to turn my water back on. Um, you really got to pay attention. If you get that wet-looking tips, it's a bummer. Fresh-looking um, I smell it at the supermarket. Chefs smell everything. I smell my food before I eat it. It's like a really weird habit that people think is really strange, but I can't, you got us. it's like this, it's because as a chef, you know, you're working in a restaurant, sometimes something might have been sitting in the walk-in for too long, and you need to know that, and the quickest way to know is to smell it. So it really doesn't have a lot of smell. If it smells like cut grass, it's a bummer. Don't, don't get that. Um, and then what I do to prepare asparagus is... Um, you know, the, the, the way I was taught, the original fancy way, I'm just going to clean up this cutting board a bit. The original fancy way is you trim off the ends, or you can, you can, you can even trim the ends and then peel some of the woody edge around it. That's, that's a little too high maintenance for me. Um, and, and then you're going to kind of gently, gently, because these, these are pretty delicate, you want the tips to be all the same at the same spot here. And then... I'm going to sort of assess where are the light parts that look like they're probably not very tender. In this case, this is, you know, asparagus, you know, it comes in all shapes and sizes, and all through the year it can vary. Um, uh, you know, obviously we get it in spring, but then there's a summer, there's a, a winter, like a December season in Mexico, so sometimes I will cheat and do a little bit of uh, asparagus in December. Um, so I'm going to, I'm in, I hate to waste, but I'm going to waste all that because it is really, that's not going to taste good. That's really woody. And... So what I was taught originally was you would um, you would use string to create these bunches, very French, and you know. And the reason why you put them in bunches, I think, is because they don't you don't want them to be breaking and j jumbling around in the pan. They just it kind of secures them. So, but many years into my cooking career, I walked by a restaurant. I saw they were just using the rubber bands. I was like, can you do that? And it's like they don't impart any flavor. So I just saved a lot of time. <laughs> and um, here, let me just make sure I put enough salt. Yeah, salty like the sea, and then, um, and then uh, you know what I always do is just two minutes. Just set a timer for two minutes. I'm going to do it right now. Hi, um, chef. Yeah. Hi. How deep is that water? Are you? Well, it's not quite deep enough. Does it does it cover the asparagus? It should. Yeah. Okay. It should. Oh, it's time. Um, <laughs> I think I was. I think I just put it on for two seconds instead of two minutes. So. Um, <laughs> By the magic of television. So yeah, so I'll just to cheat a little bit, I'm just going to kind of turn it around a couple times. But it, usually two minutes in, in, a roil, in a rolling boil is perfect. And I, you know, my sh the chefs who work with me in my kitchen, um, it's doing all kinds of crazy things as if I've set multiple timers. Let's just turn it off and I'll just use my best judgment. Um, oh, maybe that's somebody else. No, it's me. Um, <laughs> here, let's turn, let's just, ha. Um, so, um, it, you know, they, we, they like to be sort of fancy and say, you know, well, we're just, we, we don't want to just set a timer. We want to use our chefly knowledge and, you know, judge how, you know, judge whether it's done. And it's like, it's never as good as when you just set a timer for two minutes. I suppose if, um, you, uh, had really thick asparagus, you'd probably do three. But, so I'm smelling it. Uh, that's another little tip. Use your senses when you're cooking. Smell is probably the best one that you don't necessarily talk about or think about, but it's the most important thing. Pay attention to your sense of smell. That's what's going to tell you your garlic is burning. That's what's going to tell you your cake smells done in the oven or your, your muffins are done. You know, you can sm when, you, when you start paying attention, you start to pick up what a muffin smells like when it's not quite done and what a muffin smells like when it is done. So... Um, you know, it's great for uh, uh, it's great for for so many things, and it really makes a big difference. Now, here's what happened: is this burner ran out of flame, so I'm switching it over. That's happened to me at, at catering events where I've we were like waiting for something to <laughs> to 
to get hot, and it just never did. So we had to eventually realize that the stove had run out of gas. Um, okay, so I'm going to say this is, it smells just done. And then if you uh, are going to serve this later, what you do is you put it in a, in a container with cold ice water, and that stops the cooking. And I didn't bring ice water, but I do have cold water. And then you just don't want to, you don't want to leave this in here for more than a minute or so, because it would get waterlogged eventually. But I'm just going to let that cool for a minute to stop the cooking. And you can serve it hot. You can just make your asparagus that way right when you're cooking dinner and just serve it up with whatever sauce or no sauce at all. Or you can chill it, and then it'll be good for about a day. And you can use it for a crudite or, um, you know, in a salad. And now this is done, so I'll turn that off. And this smells lovely. It's got a little bit of aromatic smell. Let's turn this down a little bit. Okay. So we've cooked our asparagus, and we've cooked our quinoa salad. So I'm going to show you how to do the salmon. Um, and then I'm going to show you how to make the maisonette sauce. And there's a whole story about the maisonette sauce. So here's this. Um, let's see. Can you see that? Uh, this is a nice fillet of salmon. We do use a Loch Dwart salmon, which is, could be controversial. Um, it's considered to be like an ecologically farmed salmon where they're really conscious of, of but, but, you know, of course, wild salmon is considered to be the ideal type of salmon. Chef, uh, do you have any uh, tips on, on how to be a better home cook? I mean, sure. restaurants always well, taste I'll good. Yeah. We cannot duplicate. Right. Okay, number one. One word. You know what I'm going to say? Salt. <laughs> butter's next. But um, yeah, butter's great. But people sometimes overdo butter. I, I, I have been known to overdo butter. But um, salt. It's the number one thing. Learn how to salt evenly and carefully throughout the process, not just at the end, because it affects how things cook. It brings out the flavor. Um, and if you just throw it in at the end, it you know, it may not even intermingle and bring out all the flavors in, in time for you to eat it. Yeah. What about a, a low-salt or no-salt diet? Ooh, it's so tricky. Obviously, you adjust to that, and you stop being used to having so much salt, but then you're really going to have to do a better job of everything else. Um, definitely, you want lemon. You're going to, it's going to be hard. It's just going to, it's more, it's, uh, you don't have that sort of to fall back on. So you're never going to quite create a restaurant experience. But you know, fresh herbs, lemon juice, olive oil, uh, spice, all those things are going to at least make your mouth go wow. Um, OK, so uh, we've got this broth. I'm going to taste it one more time. Don't worry, you're not eating any of the food that I'm touching and tasting with my fingers. Um, and uh, so then the salmon is cut up into little three ounce pieces, two three ounce pieces. And this is certainly makes it a lot easier to handle. I'm sure you've tried to cook big pieces of fish. The whole thing with like cooking a whole half a salmon, like who needs it? I don't even understand. Like it's, and then, you know, you can't, and then it just gets all flaky on the buffet. You know, that was kind of an old school sort of 80s thing to have a whole filet of salmon poached. Um, but I think it's just nicer to cut it up beforehand and then you've got your portions all ready to roll. Um, and uh, this goes in here and it's just gonna take you know, two or three minutes to cook. And uh, I'm going to judge it by how it, the, that protein exterior, the way the structure sort of tightens up. Um, I personally like my salmon medium, maybe even a little beyond medium. Some people like it medium rare. Um, I just don't find that raw fish flavor appealing to personally. But, um, but uh, in, uh, and, then, and then you're going to drain it and put it... Uh, you can just throw it right in the fridge, and then it's good for until the next day. You can serve it hot this way, and you can serve it with a lot of different kinds of sauces. It's great, particularly with like a mayonnaise-based sauce, because the fish itself is, um, you know, not cooked with oil, and it's it takes well to a rich, acidic sauce like with lemon juice. So I don't think these are quite ready. I'm gonna give it another minute. Okay, so I'm gonna clean this mess up a bit. Voila. And, um, oh, question? Yeah. With regard to the vegetables, like the end of the asparagus and perhaps the end of the broccoli, 
What's the best way to make that into a vegetable broth that you can save instead of throwing that out? Good question. Whew. You know, I really hate waste, but broccoli cruciferous vegetable and the asparagus flavor, I worry that that won't make a broth that really keeps well and, is, and gives you a, a happy flavor. There's, certain, there's a reason why, you know, asparagus and um, broccoli aren't in like a vegetable broth normally. I would say get a chicken. And if you can't get a chicken, get a pig. <laughs> but yeah, no, I don't. I hate waste. I, it's just it. I, it's abhorrent to me. Um, let's see here. So I'm going to touch this. This is still pretty, you know, medium rare, but it's also quite hot. So I'm going to just let it. I'm going to let it go because I don't want to bore you while you watch me poach salmon. There we go. So I think. But I mean, some people would love this just like this. It's probably more of the medium rare. And, um, and then again, you can just serve this hot like this or with a sauce. This is skin off. This is skin, um, skin off, yeah. Um, I don't enjoy the sort of, unless you're gonna, if you some people love the skin, just like a, like a chicken skin, and yeah, I don't either. And um, you know, they sear it and make it crispy, and it, it does taste good, but it, it, it kind of creeps me out too. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna, um, as I'm uh, making you, uh, showing you how to make this sauce, I'm going to ask Gabe and uh, our volunteer slash org planners of this event to come, and they're going to start plating up food so that as I'm wrapping up the conversation about the dinner part, uh, you all can have some dinner. Because I'm imagining if you came here hungry and we're talking about food for, you know, 45 minutes, you're getting hungry, right? So um, Jill and Gabe and uh, uh, I think, I don't know if it's Monica and Jennifer are going to come up and... We'll, we'll find out who it's going to be, and uh, they'll get going on that. So meanwhile, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this sauce for you. And this is really easy. This is Julie, our cruise director. Um, so, um, so this sauce, uh, I learned how to make this sauce. This is another story about hospitality and about, I don't know, it's, it's about a lot of things. Um, uh, I made this sauce, I saw this sauce for the first time at a place called Maisonette, um, so I call it Maisonette sauce. Uh, this is Gabe. Hi, Gabe. Gabe is so sassy. Whatever he says, please do not hold it against me, please do not record it. He's so sassy. Um, so uh, I, I was traveling around the country um, as a young cook, uh, I had the opportunity to travel around the country and I was doing stages around the country, which means like working for free in restaurants. And I was able to do it all over the country. Um, my, my boyfriend at the time was a conductor of uh, musicals. And so he got a job conducting a chorus line and I was able to go with him for part of the trip. And every city we went to, I would use my Zagat's guide and I'd find out what was the fanciest restaurant in town. And I would go there and I'd say, you know, I'd like to work for free. And you know what? They always say yes. <laughs> and um, so I went to this place called Maisonette, which is an, a very well-known, you know, decades, maybe 100-year-old restaurant, I don't, I don't remember, and um, this, like, institution in Cincinnati. And they had a new chef there, and it was a big deal to have a new chef at a restaurant like that. Um, so, Gabe, you want to go? You you can start if you want to just go go ahead and start plating. Um, we're gonna give them probably two pieces of salmon, a nice big scoop of quinoa, and then yeah. And I'll I told Gabe I'm gonna be correcting as they go to make sure that everybody gets the fair amount of food. Yeah. And we'll put one of you in front of each station so you can do it assembly line cafeteria style. And then once we have a bunch of uh, plates going. I'll have finished this demonstration, and we'll take a little break so you get to eat. And then after uh, we've had some time to do that, I'm going to demonstrate the dessert, and then we can have dessert kind of as things wrap up. That'll be the final spot. And there's a spoon over there, Gabe. I left a spoon there. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and I think there's plenty of asparagus to. That's that's perfect. Yeah. And then we'll give them a little bit more sauce, a little bit more sauce on the salmon, and a little bit on the asparagus. So. Um, so I was working there for a week, and there was this new chef there. His name was Jean-Robert de Cavell. I just found out he passed away. Um, and he, um, like recently, this is 30 years later, and he, I, wa I was so fascinated because I, in, uh, deep down I was an entrepreneur in spirit. Um, and I was fascinated by this situation of this old school restaurant where there was this major change, the new chef, and he had to deal with all this staff that had been there for years um, and who, you know, liked it the way it had been done and felt like, 
who is this guy going to be and what's he going to be like? And the whole week I was there, I, I watched the chef and I noticed he was a French chef, but he was very polite and very careful in his communications and very, very kind. He was very kind to me, even when I was asked by the pastry chef to make a huge vat of white chocolate mousse, which is a very tricky thing to make. And I didn't know what I was doing, and I think I destroyed it. And they were trying to save it. He, the, she, Jean Robert de Cavell came over, and he was whisking it, trying to get it to come together. And the, it was stressful. And um, the next day, that new pastry chef was gone. They fired the pastry chef. He didn't blame me for screwing it up. but. Um, and guys, do me a favor, hold off on the serving just a few more minutes until I'm done with the demo, and then we'll do it. Yeah, but we'll just try to stage all those plates. Um, so um, he, uh, you know, he, was, he was really calm, but one day during lunch, there was a really stressful lunch service. It was very high pressure, and things, something went wrong at a table. There was some misunderstanding, miscommunication, and he was back and forth with a woman, an older woman who had been there a long time. She was a server, and I, I don't know what they were saying because I don't remember that part, but there was back and forth and back and forth, and she just kind of lost it and said, I don't care, and that's when he lost his shit, <laughs> and I thought, huh. It was kind of like a, a light bulb moment, like with my dad and the, and the red wine. Um, the only unforgivable thing is to not care. And that's something that I've taken with me with my catering business. Each of these people, they care. He's sassy. He's trouble. <laughs> Leah's delightful. He's pretty, they're all great. But they all care. And that's what you will get from us um, we, uh, when you work with us uh, for catering is we have a passion for simple, elegant food, food that you not only want to eat, but want to have eaten, I'm sure. If you've been to any number of catered events, you go and you leave feeling overstimulated and unsatisfied because um, I think caterers just, they're, they've got something to prove and they're trying to keep up with the restaurants and make it more interesting or make it, you know, prove themselves somehow. And in the end, they just leave you feeling kind of flat. So we just try to take one step back and keep it really uh, simple and vibrant and flavorful. So it's not only food you want to eat, but food you want to have eaten. And uh, this sauce, so easy. Mayonnaise. Not the healthiest, but delicious. Um, and ketchup. So this is like kind of a French Thousand Island. It's a fancy, I think probably Thousand Island came from, you know, a French-based sauce um, originally. But so it's ma uh, mayonnaise, ketchup, Tabasco, brandy, uh, and then a little bit of grapefruit juice. And then, um, you know, if you really want to get fancy, you can do a little bit of grapefruit zest as well. That's going to give you a little bit more dimension, a little bit of bitterness. But the bitterness balances out the sweetness. Again, you know, that different taste dimensions in your mouth. Um, and then kosher salt. Hugh? Yes, sir. Do I dare ask if there's a vegan version of this dressing? Of this sauce? Mm -hmm. Good question, Jeffrey. That's Jeffrey. Um, not only is, is the head of business development for our company, but he has been my best friend for over 40 years. So I, I was able to... I was able to bring Jeffrey on a year and a half ago now? Yeah, a year and a half ago. And you know, everyone was thinking, oh, great, Hugh's friend. Like, what's going to happen here? Like, that's going to suck. But I tell you, nobody doesn't like Jeff. He is a delight. So, um, uh, so and then you just mix this up. I, you can use, you know, I have a, I have whisks. A fork is probably adequate, you know, just to get it to get it going. Because you want to get the, um, you need to get the little lumps of the mayonnaise. And then this will keep for a couple weeks, you know. Um, and this is delicious with so many things. Um, I know it's going to need more salt, but I'm afraid I'm going to get judged. So mayonnaise or bust is what you're saying. Say again? Mayonnaise or bust. Oh, yeah, I totally got distracted by my story about him being my best friend. Um, they have a lot of great vegan mayonnaise now, really great. They use, like, pea protein isolate. I don't know. What are they isolating it from? I don't know. Um, but... Um, there's a few different kinds, but a lot of them are really good. So if you haven't tried vegan mayonnaise, it's, it's absolutely a great alternative. So you can make this kind of thing vegan as well. Mm. Delicious. So 
Um, so yeah, so I think we're going to take a little break, um, uh, and we're going to start passing out the food, and uh, we're going to eat for, you know, five, ten minutes, and then uh, I'll start, once everyone's got their food, I'll demonstrate the chocolate sauce that we're going to serve with dessert, and you guys can have dessert and go home and watch, you know, The Bachelorette, or is it The Bachelor? I can't keep track which is on now. We, we have one more question. Yeah. You can have as many questions as you'd like. I was wondering about um, the quality of the brandy that you would use and how long, because I don't drink it, how long would it last in my pantry? Yeah. Um, honestly, whatever you got. If you have some cor nasty cor whatever, I don't even know what's good brandy and what's not, because I don't, I don't really like either. it unless it's in either. a sauce. Um, but yeah, anything you've got is probably fine, and it does not have to be fancy. Um, and it'll and brandy, I think, lasts forever. Great, thank you so much. Sure. And you know what? If you don't want to buy a bottle of brandy, you don't have to. You could use, you could even use, I think I've used bourbon. Um, you could use, I mean, I guess you could use a little white wine. Madeira would have a strong flavor. You could use Madeira, but it would give it a more pronounced Madeira flavor. Um, masala, this, yeah, yeah, Marsala. But um, yeah, you could just leave it out and you won't really notice. It's a very subtle, elegant little addition. So yeah, we'll have time for more questions after you know we, we get rolling with the food. And I know there's a lot of food, so if anybody wants a little seconds, please don't be shy. Okay, so um, I'm, gonna, um, I'm just going to demonstrate the dessert, and it's so quick and easy. I'll tell you a little, another story. Um, this is about my mommy, Hadel. Um, she is in heaven, um, and she is a, was a great woman. She, um, she raised four kids had a, with, with my dad, had a lot of money stress. She worked full time, and she, as, and she was a Jewish mother, but she never martyred herself. She demonstrated how to take care of herself. There's so many stories about her. Um, okay, I'm gonna tell one, I'm gonna tell, well, first of all, the, um, <laughs> the reason I'm telling her about her is, right, seriously, I'm gonna start crying. Um, uh, the reason I brought her up is because she had what we call dessert anger. She was very passionate about dessert, but there were only certain desserts that are approved and certain flavors that are not. And if you give her something that's not good or that's kind of like a waste of calories, she's gonna, She's going to look askance. Um, my, my husband tells this story. Of we, went, we went to Fenton's, because we used to go to Fenton's all the time as a family. And um, she would always get, you know, like mocha fudge brownie, or, you know, chocolate, nuts, creamy. Those were her approved flavors. Caramel, some fruit things, but never in ice cream. And um, Noah got something with blueberries or something horrid. And she said, Noah, what did you get? And he said, a blueberry something. And she said, ugh, why would you get that? And, you know, he, he felt very offended. Um, so uh, I, I, I think of my mom all the time when someone tries to give me something for dessert, and I'm like, no. It, just, it brings up a rage. So this chocolate sauce is absolutely Hadel approved. I found this recipe in a Saver magazine like 30 years ago, and I just was like, okay, this is my chocolate sauce. I don't need another one because this is so delicious. So it's just this bittersweet chocolate, and I'm putting it in what we call a, a bain-marie. Is that a bain-marie? What's it called? A steam bath. Double boiler. That's not a Ban Marie. Ban Marie is when you, um, I think, when you, yeah, well, yeah, uh, that's like a, well, that's a, like a giant ramekin. Yeah, right, a Ban Marie is like a water bath. Thank you. God, it's been a while. So, a bittersweet chocolate um, in the pot. I'm just using the hot water that we used for the, um, for the asparagus because it's not going to flavor this. It's just to, to, to give you a, a, a heat that won't burn the chocolate, right? So, um, sugar, a little bit of water, heavy cream. Vanilla, butter, and salt, 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 salt. That is the final thing that really makes this really stand out. It's so good. And then you just whisk it until it all, the chocolate all melts and it comes together. And that's it. And this can be in your freezer. It's great with fresh fruit. It's great with pound cake. It's great with ice cream. Very much Hadel approved. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell one other story about my mom. This is a great one. So this story was told to me by um, an old friend, and I didn't know this story. Uh, I, I just I reconnected with this old friend, and uh, she used to help my mom at her dinner parties. And 
you know, my mom had four kids and she was trying to clean the house and she was trying to be happy at the same time and do her full-time job and worry about money. And, um, and so, you know, and she liked to, she exercised, she took care of herself. So, you know, she was getting all her stuff done and it was, the dinner party was about to start. So Andrea came to the house in her little tuxedo jack shirt and, you know, my mom said, okay, you're here, you know, here's where the hors d'oeuvres are and here's where this is and you can put this in the oven and whatever. And she went out for a jog. And this is like, literally like as the party is starting. So she's jogging and my, my and look, can you see the, um, can you see this? Okay, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tilt it. You see it now? Oh, which camera are we going to? There we go. So it just, it was, it was pretty immediate there. And, um, this chocolate sauce is uh, delicious. So, um, so my, um, <laughs> so uh, Andrea got her instructions. My mom went out on a jog, and the people are driving by my mom and like, oh hi, Hadel. They they know my mom. They know what she's up to. So she comes back, you know, 20 minutes later, and the party's in full swing, and everyone's just making themselves at home because that's the kind of house we had, and you know, there's always like food and nuts and drinks, and it was all fine. So, but, but my mom. She, t she says, I'll be right back, and she doesn't take a shower. She runs a bath. <laughs> and I just love that story. It's like, I need some me time. And so, you know, I mean, she, you know, I'm sure she was out in another 20 minutes, and it was all fine, and she was still a wonderful host, but she was not going to be mad, because you know how you have a dinner party, and you're washing the dishes at 2 a.m., and you're thinking, why did I do that? Um, and she just was not going to have that. She was not going to make herself miserable. So, um, I, uh, do we have any other questions before we wrap up? We've got a lady with the mic. What, what's your name with the mic? I'm Samantha. Thanks, Samantha. When you're buying salmon, it's hard to find salmon now that, that doesn't have skin on it. Can you uh, poach it first and then take the skin absolutely. off? Like you can yeah. if you fry absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay. You can do that. Um, it'll come right off. So no problem at all. I was reading a recipe. I think it was food and wine or gourmet. I can't remember cooks. And they were saying that vanilla paste is better to get because it's more potent and it turns out being more financially making sense because you get better flavor for less. Right. I have no experience with vanilla paste. Um, well, my experience is with van actual vanilla beans. Um, so, you know, I grew up with vanilla extract and we use it for our basic cookie recipes and things. But when you're, when you, when you're, doing fancy baking, we would get the beans and we would, you slice them down the middle and you scrape it out with the side of your, with your little paring knife. And then I think that's what you're getting is just that without being diluted. So it's the same thing, but it's, it's gonna be more thick. And I, I imagine depending on the recipe, you're gonna have to figure out how to kind of uh, dilute it into the, the, the recipe without it being clumpy, you know, um, like you would with cornstarch where you have to make a slurry and make sure it's, it dissolves. But I'm, I'm kind of guessing, honestly. Um, so you can learn more. Oh, yeah. So is there weight in serving chocolate sauce? Wait, wait, wait. Oh. Yeah, she asked, uh, Jennifer asked, what are we going to serve the chocolate sauce with? Um, we've got, uh, tonight we've got, uh, I believe, strawberries, bananas, and is it fresh pineapple? Yeah. Strawberries, bana bana uh, bananas, and fresh pineapple. Um, you can definitely have, like, chunks of uh, um, pound cake with this as well, uh, which, you know, if you get a good kind from the store, you don't have to make it. But, um, uh, but we're just keeping it light today, and it, and it's you know it's a pretty healthful type of type of a dinner. Um, I hope you feel like you know you had a meal, but you don't feel exhausted, right? There's there was some richness, but it was had a lot of food value and bright, colorful uh, ingredients. Um, thank you. You can um, if any of you are on Instagram, I wanna I want some new Instagram followers. So follow <laughs> us at Hugh Groman Group. We have beautiful images of our events, um, and you can definitely um, learn all about us at Groman Group. Dot com. If you want us for catering, I even started a new interior design company because I am insane. Um, and I love interior design as well. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. You really lovely, lovely audience. And we had a great time. Um, I certainly did. And um, uh, the dessert is going to be all set up for you out in the lobby. They're plating up fruit and chocolate. You can come back and sit down and eat it. You can, you know, eat in the lobby and mingle. 
and Jennifer might have more information. Maybe well, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, maybe we're to, not doing that. <laughs> I wanted to thank everybody and thank Hugh Gorman and his Groman and his team on behalf of Marin Healthcare District for coming tonight. Um, if you do have questions, you can certainly ask any of the volunteers around the room. And we are planning a series of these health seminars as we've done in the past. So check our website and find out more about what's coming up next. Yes, MarinHealthCareDistrict.org. That is us. Um, yeah. And so again, I want a warm round of applause for our amazing Chef Hugh tonight. And thank you all for braving the storm and coming out. And, you know, stay, have dessert, mingle, enjoy yourself. You'll probably come up and chat with Hugh. Yes, He's please. Come chat, around. ask questions, whatever. So, yeah. So, all right. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you.